Welcome, and thank you for coming this evening. I'm Corinne Goodrich, and I work for the San Mateo County Transit District. Our speakers tonight will be talking to you about healthy communities. Jean Frazier is the chief of San Mateo County Health System. Gil Peñalosa is the executive director of the Canadian nonprofit organization 80 to 80 Cities. He's also, as you can see, the former Commissioner of Parks and Recreation in Bogota, Colombia. This event is a community educational opportunity. It's funded by San Mateo County Health System and the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. Our co-sponsors include Santa Clara County Health System, VTA, who are represented tonight by Supervisor Liz Ness, Sam Trans, and Greenbelt Alliance. Before I give you an overview of the evening, I'd like to say a few words about the Grand Boulevard Initiative. We like to call the Grand Boulevard a coalition of the willing. It's an entirely voluntary forum. Our intent is to encourage participation to think locally and act locally about how we're going to grow in the Silicon Valley. From the outset, we've respected the right of each city and agency to make its own decisions. In fact, it's critical. We do promote a core division. In the materials that you saw today, the guiding principles that were put up, all of these were drawn from the plans and the policies of the local agencies and Caltrans and the transit districts that have purview over the El Camino Corridor. GBI is not a regional government, we're not a local policy-making body, and we have no control over the actions of our members. In fact, whoops, we're not an official organization at all, but rather this is a new idea about how we can bring government agencies, stakeholders, interest groups, and community members to the table on the same equal footing. We support meetings like this to help people decide what they would like their city to do, and we pass along what we learn. I want to thank the City of Palo Alto for making this room available. The city is not involved in this event in any other way. This is a meeting of the people, it's grassroots, and your input is welcome. Tonight's agenda begins with presentations by Jean Frazier and Gil Peñalosa, followed by a question and answer session. We'd like you to write your questions on the white cards that our volunteers have passed out. And we will make sure we may consolidate some of your questions, but I will make sure that everyone's questions are put forth. We also would appreciate it if you would fill out the survey form that we've given you. Please remember that there's no drinking or eating allowed in the theater, and please turn off your cell phones. The cell phone, the uh, restrooms <laughs> are located down in uh, A and B, down the hall, way down the corridor there. Um, we're going to queue up the Grand Boulevard video now, and then I will introduce Jean Frazier. Thank you. a vital role in transportation, but it also has the capacity and ability to be a wonderful place to live, work, and play. El Camino is the spine that runs from San Francisco all the way down to San Jose, and it's in need of some sprucing up. Many communities throughout the United States are left with the remains of a fruitful past. Car-centric corridors that once thrived are now spotted with businesses that have not survived the economic realities we face today. 
the cities, counties, and public and private organizations in San Mateo and Santa Clara counties have come together with state and regional agencies under the Grand Boulevard Initiative. The Grand Boulevard Initiative facilitates the planning for revitalizing 43 miles of El Camino Real and its surrounding communities. Well, currently the El Camino is a bit, in Santa Clara has been long neglected, and that's partially because there's been a widening by the state highway. We left a lot of the vacant blocks. We have an opportunity here. If we have the will to transform this street into a walkable, bikeable, transit-friendly street that's safe for people aged 8 to 80, we can make this into a beautiful part of our community. You drive down El Camino Real, you'll see that there are surface parking, uh, one-story buildings, termed as underutilized property. We'd like to introduce mixed use, which would mean at least multi-story, I mean, as, as little as two stories even. It's important to have uh, bike lanes, a very important personal component of the public transportation system. I would really like to see public outdoor spaces to exercise, to have fun, to hang out. One of the things that's really wonderful about the Grand Boulevard vision is that through the creation of the guiding principles, it sets a framework for proceeding with development, but it really leaves the choices about what that looks like to the individual jurisdictions. In order to make, uh, make it a grand boulevard instead of a major thoroughfare, you have to bring the people and you have to make it inviting and you love to eat, you love to socialize, so, uh, restaurants, uh, cafes, areas that are surrounded by services. The best advertisement is seeing people enjoying themselves. I love coming here. I usually come here about at least, at least once a week. Uh, there's a couple of things I really love about it. I think you get a sense of separateness because of the spaciousness of the patio. So you get a sense of being in the middle of things without being in the middle of traffic. I think it's a wonderful design. I mean, it really reminds me of Paris or cafes in Italy that we've got to this I think one of the reasons why we come here a lot. I think adding additional homes um, near the area would be amazing for the Fox Theater. The benefits of having additional um, people downtown will basically be making sure that our restaurants stay open, making sure that our stores are filled with people, making sure that our venue is filled with people who would love to be entertained. My idea of having a really wonderful community is to have things that are kind of local that you can walk to. Art is right here, the walking paths are here, Kaiser is here. It's, it's just incredibly convenient. On Friday and Saturday evenings, Thursday nights, this place is hot. Two to three thousand people are here spending their money supporting local merchants and, even more importantly, feeling proud of their community. This is about the community. We're doing it so that the people who live here feel like they have an asset that they value and works for the kind of life and style that they can. Now is the time for community members to get involved and stay informed. Help shape the future of your community and become a friend of the Grand Boulevard Initiative. We are friends of the Grand Boulevard Initiative and you can be too. Jean began as the Chief of San Mateo County Health System in 2009, and she has been a moving force in the county and beyond to expand traditional public health functions to the role of the built environment in our health and creating healthy communities. She was the Chief Executive Officer of San Francisco uh, Health Plan, creating affordable health coverage for 53,000 low and moderate income <coughs> families prior to coming to the health system. And she also was, before that, the managing attorney to advise the San Francisco Departments of Health and Human Services. Jean holds a law degree from Yale Law School and a bachelor's degree from Yale University. Please welcome Jean Frazier. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm sure you're wondering why it is uh, that the 
that the health system is one of the co-sponsors of tonight's event that focuses on our streets and neighborhoods and one of the major sponsors of the Grand Boulevard Initiative. And tonight I'd like to give you a couple of reasons why. Our nation and in fact our world are facing two major public health challenges. The first one, and perhaps the greatest one, is climate change. Not only does climate change threaten our world and our nation with major uh, natural disasters such as hurricanes and tornadoes that will have a huge uh, human health impact, but even locally there are going to be effects that we might not expect, such as rising sea level that in San Mateo County alone threatens 100,000 homes on the Bayside, as well as our very fragile water system that is threatened by the climate disruptions uh, that may affect our water supply. One of the major causes of climate change is the substitution of physical activity for carbon-based activity. And that substitution has a second major public health effect, and that is the obesity epidemic. Again, this is not limited to the United States, uh, but it is seen most apparent here. Let me take you through a very quick trip in time. This is 1985 when the Centers for Disease Control started saying we're noticing that we seem to be getting larger and uh, started asking states to actually measure what percentage of our adults met the clinical definition for obesity. And as you can see in 1985, most states didn't even measure this. Not very long after this, you can see where we are today with states where the adult population is over 30% meeting the clinical definition of obesity. And again, from a public health perspective, this has an enormous toll on individuals as well as communities and of course on our society as a whole. In fact, from an economic perspective, the estimates are that the obesity epidemic in the United States costs us $50 billion each year. So when we're thinking about the questions that uh, Gil will raise and that have already been raised uh, today about what is the issue? Is it really finances or is it political will? I would uh, also land on that same side that it's actually political will. The problem with these two public health challenges is that if we do nothing, if we do nothing to confront these twin challenges, we will be the first generation to doom our children to live shorter lives than we do. And since the public health community's mission is to improve the quality as well as the length of our lives, this is utterly unacceptable to us. We are strong supporters of the Grand Boulevard Initiative and of the Grand Boulevard Initiative principles because what we need to do is to re-engineer physical activity back into our lives so that we can move from a fossil fuel dependent way of moving through the day to a health promoting way of moving through the day. By mixing homes, jobs, retail uh, that serves neighborhoods along the El Camino corridor, we can make the healthy choice of being on your feet, or on bikes, or on public transit, the easier choice. And this will have major uh, benefits, not just for our communities, but for our economies as well. So tonight, we've invited an inspiring speaker to help get you uh, more inspired and more involved than you are already. Because we know that on a local level, we need your support not the health system, not, not the individuals here, but those out in the community, your elected officials, your appointed officials, who are working so hard to implement the Grand Boulevard principles, but who face opposition. And so our goal tonight is to inspire you to get even more involved, if you're already involved, and if you're not, uh, to join the fold, so that we can make sure that the Grand Boulevard principles are not just principles, but actually show up as changes on our streets and our neighborhoods. And to that end, we're very excited to bring to you Gil Peñalosa. Uh, Gil is an internationally renowned livable city advisor and social marketing strategist who's passionate, and I know you'll see that tonight, about making cities work for people of all ages, all abilities, all socioeconomic backgrounds. Originally from Bogota, Colombia, as we've seen, uh, Gil holds an MBA from uh, our own UCLA Anderson School of Management, where he recently was selected as one of the most inspirational alumni in the school's history. 
As the executive director of the 8 to 80 cities organization, Gil advises elected officials, planners, and policymakers around the world on how to create economically successful, vibrant, and healthy communities. His deep experience in varied cultural settings, his passion for making places that invite, entertain, stimulate, and empower us make Gil an inspiring speaker who keynotes gatherings across the world. We feel so very fortunate to have been able to entice him to come join us in the Bay Area. Please join me in welcoming Gil Pena-Lisa. It's, uh, it's such a pleasure to be in a place with people, such a mixed group of people. Public health, you know, until a few years ago, public health seemed to be relegated just to doing studies out of the background, but all of a sudden now they're out front saying, you know, we gotta work on the built environment. So this is really, really exciting, and I'm gonna be talking about uh, how to create vibrant cities and healthy communities. And by the way, you know, if we could turn off these lights on the front, that would be great. <laughs> Not for me, because I'm sorry, you can do it. And uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about cities for people. And you might say, you know, what, what about cities for people? You know, it sounds so simple. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, when we take a look at any of our cities, there are so very few places even few streets where we could let our 80 year olds or 80 year olds just wander around and go out and get an ice cream or uh, just be on their own. So, you know, it's, even though it sounds so simple, the reality is that there are very few places that are even nice of a city for people. And so, when I'm asked, you know, what is this 8 to 80 cities? Well, 8 to 80 cities is not really about walking or cycling or parks or streets. Those are means, those are means, those are not ends. Our ends is, how can we contribute to create vibrant cities with healthy communities? Where the citizens are going to live happier, enjoy public places. So that is our goal. And when we're doing any kind of work, whether we're doing workshops or consulting or things, people always ask, is this intersection safe? Can I send my children walking to school? Can my grandparents bike to the park? And I said, look, you, you don't have to be a PhD in engineering. You just got to follow three simple steps. It's like a rule of thumb. Step number one, think of a child, an eight-year-old, you know, your son or daughter or grandkids or something uh, that you really love. Once you have that child in mind, then go to step number two. Think of an older adult that you also care for. And when you have the child and the older adult in mind, then go to step number three. Would you send them across that intersection? Would you send them walking to get eggs or milk or to go to school? Or would you send them on a bike to go to the park or to go to work? If you would, it's because safe enough. If you would not, it's because it's not. And we gotta do it better. You know, what if everything that we did in the Bay Street area, the indicator is that it had to be fantastic for the eight and the eight year olds? You know, we gotta stop. We, we would probably end up creating good communities for everybody because we gotta stop building cities as if everybody was 30 year old and athletic. <laughs> we gotta build cities for all. And that's what we're here talking about. That, and that's what 8280 cities is about. And also we got some shared values about sustainable happiness and equality. What do we mean by sustainable happiness? It's happiness that contributes to the individual, the community and the global well-being. But that does not exploit other people, the environment, or future generations. So that is our, our part of our search. And then another value is equality. Equality around sustainable mobility and a value uh, and equality around parks and other public places. So this is some of, uh, of our beliefs. And when we talk about equality, we really think that anybody, especially anybody living in any of the cities around the world, should, ha should be able to move around. You know, it doesn't make any sense that in the wealthiest country in the world, 
in the U.S. that has gone, has increased by over 100 million people in the last 30 years, but nevertheless, our children, most of our children have to be, are almost slaves to the car, to people who drive cars. They cannot get around. People say that a walkable community, a test of a walkable community is where a child can go out and buy an ice cream and walk home before the ice cream melts. <laughs> well, in most communities, the, the child cannot really do it. And also, we gotta have parks and public places. You know, we talk about uh, physical activity. The reality is that everybody should have a park within walking distance. Everybody should have, you know, the closer that people live to a park, the more likelihood that they're gonna be physically active. As Jean said, I, I went to graduate school at UCLA. Los Angeles has a lot of parkland, but all of it is in one side of the city. So, two out of three children do not have access to a park within walking distance. Two out of three. And when you take a look at the map, that's also where the highways of obesity are. And if you take a look at the, at a third layer, that's also where the low-income people live. So everything is really related to everything. And you know, talking about parks, people say, you know, and should my city have, should we focus on small parks or big parks? You know, unfortunately, you gotta focus on all of them. We gotta focus on the small ones because in the neighborhood park, that's where we build community. That's where we really meet the parents of our children's friends. And that develops the community and safety and a sense of belonging. And so, but if we want to go and play soccer, we cannot play soccer in that because that only has a play one. So then we got to have the medium-sized parks. But if we want to go canoeing or so, we got to go to the metropolitan parks. So each one is satisfying very different needs. So at the end of the day, we got to have all three parks, the different sizes, but also we got to have them as a city park system. So that's one of the things that we're going to be talking later on. And this is about how do we want to live? How do we want to live? And that's the theme for tonight is how do we want to live? Because we're going to be recreating cities and recreating cities for people. And there are some ingredients. And some of the ingredients, for example, assume, let's do an analogy if we're going to make a pasta. We can just boil some water. And we put the pasta with no salt or no butter, nothing. Just water and then the pasta cooks, and it's a spiceless pasta. And then they give you a spiceless pasta for one day, and then you say, oh, it's okay. But then the next day, they give you the same spiceless pasta, and the next day, the same and so on. You know, sooner or later, you say, my God, you know, either I get ingredients and I do a nicer pasta, or I go somewhere else. So then you can get the ingredients, you get the nice pasta, and that's a little bit different, right? So the same thing happens with the cities. The cities have different, you know, it's very different to go to a spice city or a spiceless city. <laughs> and people do not like to live in spiceless cities. And people move out. People that have a possibility, they move out of the spiceless cities. And what I mean by a city with spices? Cities that are nice for the children, cities that are nice for the older adults. And it's, it's not that hard. Let me give you a couple of examples. Which is spice and which is spice less. Like here, as think how people here used to go and buy bread or eggs or milk or so on, and what happened afterwards? You know, some of this, you know, this has won awards for architecture. But who's going to make a friend in this street <laughs> as compared with this one? So these are some of the things. It's not about the money. This park costs a lot of money. But when would you go to this park? You go to this park once, you take some photos, you never go back because there's nothing to do. <laughs> Instead here, it doesn't cost a lot of money, but you will go over and over and over because there's so many things to do. You know, so these are the kind of things that they, they spice less or the spiced. And so what are the ingredients of a city for people? They know, the first ingredient is pedestrians. Why pedestrians? Because that's how human beings were made. We are pedestrians, you know? It doesn't matter what part of the world, we got two eyes and two ears. We walk at around three miles an hour. And when we walk, we use all our senses, you know? We hear the birds singing, and we see the children playing, and we go in front of a coffee place, and we smell the aroma. And it's something that is, so we use all our senses, we really enjoy, and we meet people, and we see people face to face. And by the way, one of the reasons why walking is so important is that Every trip begins and ends by walking. You know, we walk to places. We walk to the cars, we walk to transit, we walk everywhere. So the pedestrian, also from the point of view of vulnerability, the most vulnerable is the pedestrian. So pedestrians has to be our, our, our priority. But very close to pedestrians are the cyclists. 
And I said that cycling is almost a more efficient way of walking. If I want to do half a mile, I walk. But if I'm, I want to do three miles, I go on a bike. But both are not motorized. Both, you see people eye to eye. Both, you develop that sense of community. But if you're going to go even further away, then you take public transit. But we got to remember, we're, be, we're investing billions of dollars across the U.S. in public transit. But public transit will never pick us up in front of our houses and drop us off in front of our destination. So if the cities are not walkable, if the cities are not bikeable so that we can get to public transit, the investment in public transit is not going to be as efficient. Or if we're going to go to public transit, the intersection is not safe. Or the sidewalk has cr uh, lots of cracks or has a post in the middle of it. So then we get public space. And public space is kind of the glue that links all of them together. And when we got all of them together, then we got really cities for people. And what I mean with public space also is not just any, we're going to take public transit, and you know, if it has a place that, that sells flowers, it's nice. But then if they sell newspapers, it's even better. And if they had a, a, a water fountain and a telephone and a coffee shop and so on. So those are, then we start having nice public places. Because when we start talking about the Camino Real, this is the kind of things that we got to have to create places for people. And then we got sustainable mobility, and this is one of the things that create nice cities, you know? And some people might say, oh, Gil, you know, here in the Bay Area, distances are very far away. That's what people say all over the place, but it's more a perception, you know? In the U.S., almost one out of three trips are within a 20-minute walk. And half of them are within a 20-minute bike ride. And that's the same place. We were doing the study in Mexico City. In Mexico City, it's a gigantic city, and people say, oh, you know, distances are so far. Well, we did a study of origin and destination, and there's 21 million trips per day. Of the 21 million, 11 million trips are less than 5 kilometers, so less than 3 miles. So we said, you know, why don't we start with those that are less than 3 miles? You know, in Scotland, also half of the trips are less than 1.5 miles. So there, you know, there's a lot of this that can be done. Currently, I am director of... A, 880 cities, which is an NGO based in Canada. And one of the nice things is that I get to do a lot of traveling, meet wonderful people like you, enjoy great events like yesterday, the Sunday streets in San Francisco. So I want to tell you about some of the places where I've been recently. You know, I'm, by the way, when I'm telling you about some of these places, don't tell me, oh, girl, you know, here in the Bay Area, we are different. <laughs> we got nothing in common with Copenhagen or Bogota or New York. You know, we are in in the <laughs> yeah, I think always remember that you are absolutely unique. Yeah, like everyone else. <laughs> you know, of course you are unique, but even Palo Alto is different, San Mateo is different than Santa Clara, and even each neighborhood is different, each street is different, but we gotta have an attitude, not like on the computer that we copy and paste, but it's how to adapt and improve. And we're gonna see hundreds of photos some of communities that are wealthier, so much more poorer. Some are bigger, some are smaller. But everything that we're going to see is doable. So it's not only about just the, 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 the El Camino Real, but very th things that can be adapted. So let's keep that up in mind. A week ago, last Monday, I was in Brisbane, Australia. Actually, when I went to Brisbane, I thought when I was biking, I was going to bike into huh. Russell Grove. <laughs> no such luck. <laughs> Actually, I was even more hopeful. I thought I was going to bike into El McPherson. <laughs> <laughs> but no such luck here, you know. Actually, and she really symbolizes cycling. You know, it's healthy, it's fun, it's exciting. But I bike into this guy. <laughs> <laughs> but you also learn from this guy because they told me, oh, he's a mammy. I said, what? A mammy? What is a mammy? And they said, oh, those are the middle-aged men in Lycra. <laughs> Well, those middle-aged men in life are going to live here for a long time. And that's just a myth, because the people that are sad are people like anybody else. And, you know, wearing everyday clothes, you know, they don't have to wear as if they were going to go to some special places. And actually, when I was in Sydney, you know, what do the men carry when they go cycling in Sydney? The surfboard. What do the women carry? Their husbands. <laughs> so they can't read their books. You know, and in Sydney, some of the things that is interesting when I say everything is linked to everything. You know, they are doing these bikeways. They used to have only painted nuns. But painted nuns, they don't work any, anywhere. And I'm going to show you that in, in, in a little while. 
But so they are changing the painting lines for a physically separated bike. So that we have a separation between pedestrians and cyclists. So it's safe for pedestrians. Or also between cyclists and cars, so it's safe for everybody. And if they're not doing it to promote cycling. Cycling is not the end. They are doing it because they want to reduce emissions, they want to reduce congestions, and they want to improve public health. So that's why they are doing it. And then, you know, one of the that, in Brisbane, look at this. We gotta take advantage of any opportunity. So, for example, the Camino Real is gonna be the 100th anniversary, you said, soon. Uh, so when you get the 100th, bring it back into an event. So here you say, oh, it's the Bicentennial Bike. So they built this wonderful Bicentennial. So it's a nice project. You, all of a sudden, you brand the project, and it's easy to get people aligned and to develop a sense of urgency. And they build this one and, and create it even with bumps so that the bicycles will keep on low speed and these are some of their public bikes. And, and it's an interesting. And you know, when I say everything is linked to everything, for example, they just finished a study showing that people that take public transit on average, they do 41 minutes of physical activity per day. You know, the World Health Organization, before people used to think, you know, oh, no pain, no gain, you gotta do two, three hours a day and run marathons. <laughs> well, now it's 30 minutes a day. If you do 30 minutes a day, well, if you take public transit, you're already doing 41 minutes a day. So when you get home, if you take the car, you do eight minutes a day on average. So with these people that take public transit, when they get home, they have more time for themselves or to spend with their family. Or if they go running or playing soccer, whatever, they do it out of enjoyment, but not because they gotta do their 30 minutes a day. So this is really interesting. Now let me tell you a little bit about Copenhagen. And in Copenhagen, I go often because I'm also a senior consultant with Gell Architects. And here, I was there last week. Actually, I flew from Copenhagen on Friday. We, 23 of us were having lunch in the space of one car. That's an option. <laughs> but change is hard. Don't think that change is hard in San Mateo, in Santa Clara. Change is hard everywhere. In Copenhagen, where they want to create the first pedestrian street, they said, what? Pedestrian streets, you know, because the cars were also taking over in the 60s, in the 70s, and they said, well, you know, you know are you going to get the cars out so people walk? You know, there are too many cars. And then the weather is horrible because it's cold in the winter, it's hot in the summer, it rains all year. But the number one barrier, what they did on pedestrian streets, was because they said, oh, it's not part of our culture. You know, pedestrian, that's for the Italians. <laughs> because the Italians are loud and noisy and they like to be on the streets. But we are danger, we are quiet, and we are calm, and we don't go out. <laughs> Let me tell you that the Danish now are more Italian than the Italians. <laughs> they love their pedestrian streets. That's where the biggest we get in this rain, in the sun. This is City Hall in Copenhagen. And all of a sudden, they went from a car invasion to people places. They have turned more than 18 parking lots into people places. And this was the first pedestrian street. And look in the middle of the winter, everybody with their coats and gloves, and they're using it. And this is what people were doing. You know, it's so nice to have all of you here because this is what it takes. You know, the citizens can no longer be spectators. The citizens have to participate. If you are not writing letters to the editor, if you are not going to the public meetings, if you are not participating in politics, someone else is. And that someone else is setting the agenda. So maybe this is what it took, what it was like in the 70s or 80s. Maybe now it's through the internet and through other modes. But the citizens have to participate. And by the way, look how cycling has been increasing in the last 40 years in Copenhagen. And, but this is what we need in any place in North America. We need children and we need all the adults and we need men and we need women. And you know, 38 out of 100 people, uh, out of 100 trips are done on a bike. 38. Despite the fact that they got a high per capita income than almost any city in North America. So it's not, it's not something for the poor. No, everybody does it. The poor, the rich, the young, that's how they go to the theaters. And even in the middle of the snow, 70% continue to bike. Yeah, that poor little girl. <laughs> <laughs> Why do they bike? Do they bike for environmental reasons? No, only 1% for environmental reasons. And then six financial and one out of five for exercise. And most of the people is because it's easy. It's fast and it's convenient. So what do they mean, easy, fast, and convenient? Well, one, they consider everybody, the moms and the babies and the little children. Also the women, even if they ride on the, they're amazing. They, got, they ride their bikes in high heels and they have, are smoking and talking on the telephone and everything at the same time. 
and the guys with the guitars, and the newcomers that come from places where cycling is not part of their culture, they order adults, even if they're using a trike. So all of the bikeways are unidirectional, so it's very consistent, always on the right side, always with a physical separation. So at one level is for the cars, at another level for the bikes, at another level for pedestrians. So it's always something that is really safe. When it's in the middle of, of the green spaces, then they can have bidirectionals and others. But when it's on the streets, it's always unidirectional. And then these are other modes, also giving priority. For example, on the streets, the sidewalks and the bikeways, they continue and level. So when the cars are turning right, it's the car, the one that has to go up and down. So the cars really slow down when they're making a turn. So this makes it safe. You know, in the US last year, 80,000 pedestrians were hit by cars. 80,000. Uh, and we just assume that that's, you know, that's part of the normal life. You know, 3,500 people died today in traffic accidents around the world. 3,500 yesterday, 3,500 tomorrow. According to the World Health Organization, 1.3 million people died in traffic accidents. And it's because the cars, mainly, one of the main reasons is because the cars are just going too fast. So this is one of the things to slow down the cars. Also, they got traffic calming all over the world. So it's not just putting up signs, but making it impossible for the cars to go any faster. And that, then they, they go shopping on their bikes, and they are kind of also going to work, and they go to enjoyment and playing and so on. Also because it's fun. It's a, and by the way, how do they dress for, to, go, to go cycling? You know, cycling is not just for the 20 to 50 men in spandex. <laughs> it's something that anybody can do at any time. And they come. For example, look, this, I, I took this in the middle of the winter, and at, this, at, at midnight goes to zero. So at 2 a.m., 700 cyclists have already gone by. Then I came back at 3 p.m. and 4,000 cyclists, and then over 7,000, even in the middle of a snowstorm. So counting is something that is very, very important to get. And of course, if they got bad weather, then they gotta have better facilities and so on. And you know, and with regards to the weather, you know, it's not that big of an issue if it rains or anything. You know, the Danish said there's no such thing as bad weather. It's bad clothing. <laughs> <laughs> so we dress properly, it's okay, it starts to rain and we continue, you know, it's not, not, nothing really that critical, and also to reduce anxiety. All of the taxis are going to have bike rides and connecting with the trains and so on. So it's something that is really interesting, and that's why people bike and the combinations of bike parking and creating a network. If we really want to have, have people cycling, it cannot be just building a bikeway that doesn't go from anywhere to anywhere. We need to create a network, and they're not just happy that 38 out of 100. Now they want to go to 50 out of 100. So 50 out of 100, now they're building wider and they're eliminating areas for cars. And you know, they're continuing to transform this. That's what easy, fast, and convenient is, is all about. So it's very, very interesting because the pedestrian, the second, the public transit infrastructure is almost a symbol of the respect for people. But let's move to another continent. Two weeks ago, I was in Johannesburg, in South Africa. And it was interesting. I was working for the city of Johannesburg and in all of these issues of non-motorized, and also they are building BRTs, and there is a huge issue of poverty. Of course, 18 years ago, they had a major transformation, the end of apartheid, and, and they, but nevertheless, and they are doing some interesting thing. This is Mandela's house, and, but nevertheless, there is still a lot of issues and social issues, like many, some neighbors extremely wealthy, some extremely poor, and many gated communities, even gated parks, and so on. And this is the mayor and the minister of transportation. And we did a lot of interesting activities. For example, one of the activities, we gathered uh, 20 of the senior staff from the city and 20 leaders from the taxi drivers. Mm -hmm. And we said, okay, take off your hat of taxi driver and now you take off your hat of bureaucrat, move uh, out of your desk and let's go for a walk. And we went for a 90 minute walk around the city taking a look what were the impediments, what, what are the issues, how to make life better for pedestrians. And it was very, very interesting, and then afterwards we got together and we shared ideas and suggestions and, and how to improve, and it's, it's really amazing, all the wonderful suggestions and recommendations that came out of that meeting. And then, since I had a couple of days in between Johannesburg and I was going to Brisbane, then I went to a beautiful natural park, the Kruger National Park. And I got there, and it was nice, and it was the evening, and, 
Then we did a camp. And I found lots of interesting things, you know? Some of the monkeys, they like to pick their legs. Yeah. Others, they have their little kids. And when their kids grow up, then they, yeah. they scratch their backs. <laughs> so they crocodiles, and you know, they really keep an eye on the hippos because they, they, they can kill the hippos, but also the hippos can kill them. So they gotta be very careful on some of those. So they always gotta keep an eye open to see what's going on. The elephants, they know so much about things, even like here, the females, you know, the pregnancy of the females is 22 months. Can you imagine? So the women that complain about nine months, this is 22. And then the male elephants, they get upset, so then they just go on the road. And look at the babies. Oh, it's nice. And, you know, this, these are really, really the kings. And these lions. And, but it, it's interesting, you know, they know so much about all of this, you know. And, I mean, God, I don't know what, what God thinking when he created this one. Because, <laughs> <laughs> it's like a bull's eye. <laughs> Not very nice. And the, the giraffes, are, well, they can grow six meters, you know, and it's a... Uh, Magnificent, even, and they're so nice, they let, they let the birds stand on them, but oh. others they are rather watch from the top, so they can't really see what's going on. And some people are really killing the rhinos because they want to use the horn, which has been something absolutely critical. And in some places, people think that this is what the male in palace are so happy, because one male has all of these females. <laughs> Other people say that's why they are so happy, and I'm not really sure. <laughs> but something that after hearing all of these people about it, they just talk to me, you know, why is it that we know so much about what makes animals happy? You know, we're going to do any public work in any city, and we're going to do an environmental assessment. You know, ah, what's going to happen with the raccoons? What's going to happen with the birds? What's gonna, but not what's going to happen with people. You know? We know so much about what makes animals happy, but we know so much, so little about what makes people happy. And maybe that's why we have been building cities the way that we have been building them. And maybe that's why we gotta build cities in a different way. Let me take you last example, Seoul, Korea. In Seoul, you know, the changing stream is fantastic. When we say building cities the way we are, there was a stream, a river going through the middle of Seoul, and what did they do? They built six lanes of cars. And what happens when you build six lanes of cars? It gets full. What happens when it gets full? People say, why don't we do a second floor? So they did an elevated highway. And when they, they, you get an elevated highway, it gets full as well. So then they wanted a third floor. But then the mayor said, you know, instead of doing a third story, because it was all full, then 13 kilometers, you know, about eight miles through the middle of the downtown, he took it down, the second and the first, and he brought the river out. And this was about seven years ago, you know, this 2005. It was really incredible, can you imagine? And then the people came out and he created a wonderful linear park. And obviously, it wasn't by consensus, change is hard. Some people were complaining and said, oh, man, if you take that highway down, people are not going to stop for coffee. I see people going at 60 miles an hour, we're going to stop for coffee. <laughs> But nevertheless, he continued, and you know, when Obama was there two years ago, where did they take him? They take him to this linear park, and now it's booming, it's great for businesses, you know? Because the reality is that Seoul realized, the mayor realized that no city of that size will ever solve the issue of mobility through the private car. None. That's, thousands of cities have tried in the last 60 years, and not, not one has solved the issue. It's only through public transit. It's through cycling, through walking, through a different built environment. So these are the kind of bold ideas that we're going to think when we are in our minds when we were thinking of El Camino Real. And by the way, you know, this is the person who did it. When he was, he entered the Hyundai Corporation, that is the largest developer in, 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 Korea, in South Korea. When he was 36, he became CEO of Hyundai Corporation. And when he was 36, a, a CEO, he built the elevated highway. And then in 2002, he became mayor of Seoul, and as mayor of Seoul, he took it down. <laughs> and it was very gutsy. But nevertheless, a message to the politician is that sometimes it pays off to be gutsy because now he's the president of South Korea. <laughs> so these are the kind of things of being bold. 
So, why so much effort? Why am I talking about walking or cycling or streets or this? Because there are so many benefits to the community. On the one hand, we got cleaner air, because walking and cycling and public transit has fewer gas emissions. But it also is good recreation for all, regardless of the age or the ethnicity or the social status or whatever. You know, it makes us healthier. And Jill talk, uh, made a, a much better presentation than me on this, but is this what the future <laughs> looks like? You know? The reality is that the lack of physical activity and the obesity has so many issues of heart attacks and respiratory problems and anxiety and depression and so on. And the cities and the countries where walking and cycling is a normal part of everyday life, the rates of obesity are very low. So that's really the only way to get the rates of obesity down. If we can walk or bike as a normal part of everyday life. It's also great for economic development because it creates vibrancy, businesses and restaurants. By the way, how much stuff can I carry when I'm walking or cycling? I can carry things only for two or three days. So it's really good for local business. How much stuff can I carry when I'm on my car for two or three weeks? So then it's good for big box stores. So we gotta think which one do we want to promote? You know, and like the CEO of the Chamber of Commerce in Billings, and trails are no longer viewed as a community amenities. They are as essential infrastructure for building recruitment. You know, and so it's something that is talented people move to Billings because of the trail system. And actually, you know, last year, Fortune magazine named Billings as the number one small city attracting business. So everything is connected to everything. You know, it also contributes to make transit better. Because, you know, we are in Japan, we see this is because it's close to a transit station or Christchurch in New Zealand or whatever. It improves mobility by itself. And this is where we got to be bold because walking or riding a bicycle or public transit is almost like a human right. It's the right to mobility. And someone might say, oh, in the Bay Area, almost everybody drives a car. No. Not almost everybody drives a car. You know, even in the wealthiest and most sprawl community in the Bay Area, 30% of the people do not drive. You know, everyone under 16, they don't drive. And about 30% of the over 60, even if they have cars, they don't drive. So, the reality is that we gotta start thinking, what is the role of the streets? When we look at any city from the air, the biggest public space are the streets. And by public space is the space that belongs to all of us. The rich and the poor, the young and the old, everybody. So how are we going to use it? If this is our largest public space, we clearly know that pedestrians, cyclists and transit occupy much less space than the cars. So if it's the most valuable, how are we going to use it? You know, and it's not only the big cities, smaller communities. Look at this damn garden, this, some of these sketches that shows also how can they be transformed. Many of these roads that have been built for cars in the last... 40, 30, 20 years, and now we gotta change them and we gotta make it people friendly and we gotta start dreaming on how the Camino Real is gonna look like. So this is some of the other things. How are we gonna make it more people friendly? And what is the re retail gonna look like? And how are we gonna be building? Are we gonna have all of these cars that no one likes to walk next to them? Or are we rather gonna have more and more, more people oriented with retail and, and all of these things? So, so these are some of the ideas that we're going to start thinking about. And the traditional plan is that we have one department thinking of the trees, another one of the cars, another one of the buildings, but we can have more people oriented, a more holistic point of view. You know, with PPS, we have done a lot of work with them in different places. Like, this is New Haven, Connecticut. All of the sudden, you know, this was a street corner that you would not want to spend one more second than you had to, because it was dark and it was dangerous. And you know, part of the idea is to empower the community. So like, let's say if you were gonna go here and, and you said, I, I can live here if I, I give you good ideas on how to improve the street corner. What would you do to improve the street corner? Anybody has an idea or you think that is perfect? You wanna give the idea? <laughs> Why in the sidewalk? Why in the sidewalk? Why in the sidewalk? Right, what else? A dedicated bike lane. Huh? Dedicated bike lane. Dedicated bike lanes. More trees. More trees. Flowers. You know, Jean, I know that you went to Yale University. <laughs> but the people in Yale are gonna be very jealous because you know it took him three hours and it has taken them three minutes <laughs> to realize, yeah, that's what people want. They came, when you ask people, they came with hundreds of ideas. 
Why don't you take away the first two cars? And we say, why? So that you can widen the sidewalk. Why widen the sidewalk? So we can put a garbage bin. You can, we can put a bench. We can put a tree. We can ask the private sector to improve the retail. And you know, this street corner went from a place that you wouldn't want to spend one more second than you had to, to a destination place. I mean, you, got, you change one, it's nice, but if you change five, you, got, you get a nice street. If you change 20, you get a nice neighborhood. So these are the kind of things. This is Oros. You know, there used to be 35 years ago a river going through here. And then a transportation engineer said, let's be efficient. And to be efficient, let's build a road on top of it. And seven years ago, someone said, you know, wasn't there a river going down? <laughs> seven years ago. And that person brought it out. You know, where would you like to live? You know, these are the kind of things that we gotta realize. So, do we, are we building, you know, streets for cars or streets for people? Because it's up to all of us. You know, do we want a street to look like car storage or a street to actually help create community? You know, change is difficult. For example, this one. All of a sudden, we get, we get this, build these parking lots that work like a gigantic vacuum that sucks the life out of the city <laughs> and create a street for ghosts. Or we put street level activity and then park it in the second, third, and fourth story. Here there were 93 cars parked. And when the mayor says, should we make this pedestrian? You know, change doesn't happen, it's not unanimous. If you want change to be unanimous, you have to water down change so much that it's not, it's not going to be changed any longer. So the idea is what is the general interest? And the general interest must prevail over the particular. So this guy in the restaurant said, oh, if, you, if my clients don't park, I'm going to go broke. And the guy here was selling shirts and said the same thing. So the mayor listened to everybody. At the end of the day, they made it pedestrian. And you think that anyone went broke? <laughs> 20,000 people buy more food than 93 cars. <laughs> so that's part of the idea. You know, it, it, it's, sometimes you got to be bold and you got to be risky, you know. And the street space, you know, is a <coughs> valuable asset. So we're going to start thinking, well, how are we going to use it? And that's why I think that all over the world, we got to really thank the people that are walking, the people that are cycling, and they should be our real heroes, not these ones. And we gotta give presents. I'm gonna tell you two presents that we gotta give these people. One is we gotta lower the speeds. In every single neighborhood all over the world, the speed in the residential area should be 20 miles an hour or less. And you know, it's not just because it sounds nice, you know, 20 is plenty, but the reality is, oh, by the way, you know, the mayor of Chicago. Uh, last week or the week before, he announced that one of his goals is to reduce the speed limit to 20 or less, which is really, really fantastic. He is doing so many great things, the new mayor. But the World Health Organization recommended this last year. The European Parliament recommended it three months ago. Why 20? For many reasons. One is that there are many studies that it shows that if a car hits you at 20 miles an hour, only 5% probability of being killed. If it hits you at 40, it's going to be 80%. In addition, we might walk at 3 miles an hour and we might bike at 10 or 12. So when the cars are going at 20, we feel at ease. When the cars are going at 30 or 40, we don't. You know, walk our neighborhoods is not only just about short distance. In addition to short distance, we got to have an enjoyable walk. So this, and by the, when we do surveys and we ask people, you know, would you like the street where you live to be 20 miles or less? You know, over 90% of the people say yes. And they say, would you like everybody else's street to be 20 miles or less? Then it goes down to about 50%. <laughs> but, never, so, but this is something that is really, really important to create livable neighborhoods. More than anything else probably is to reduce it. And it's not one study. There are many, many studies that show the same trend. The second present is we got to give them a network of protected bikeways that are physically separated between pedestrians, cyclists, and cars, you know. And because a bike, the other guy was in a city that the mayor said, oh, Gil, we don't have a bicycle culture. And I said, what do you mean? He said, oh, we build a bikeway and no one is using it. I said, how long is it? She said, oh, it's about a mile. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, if you build a mile that doesn't connect anything with anything, unfortunately, you're going to build a grid. Once again, the mayor of Chicago, you know, when Emmanuel, when he came on to, on, on, as mayor, in his first 30 days, he built the first protected by in Chicago. The first 30 days, you know. There are mayors that it takes him a year just to get to know the name of the executive assistant. <laughs> this guy in 30 days. And now he wants to do 100 miles in the first two years. And it's not because 100 miles sounds nice. No, it's because you need to build a grid. If you don't build a grid, then it's not going to work. 
But by the way, so we need, you know, the painted lines, they don't, they don't work anywhere. You know, this is Kentucky. It's not about the Bay Area. It's, it's anywhere, you know. You can go to other cities. This is Christchurch, New Zealand. Uh, you know, this is New York. Or this one is Toronto near my office. This guy was almost killed. Yeah. And, you know, we were the car driver. He was buying a hot dog. <laughs> and when the only thing you got between you and an SUV is a painted line, and the cyclist goes on the sidewalk, and the pedestrian is injured, and the pedestrian is going to be our top priority. So we need to build a grid of permanent physically separated bikers that is safe for the pedestrian, is safe for the cyclist, safe for the cars, for the transit, and we're going to think of daytime and nighttime and rain and good weather and bad weather. So how to make it safe for everybody? And this is, you know, my daughter goes to McGill University in Montreal, and this used to be painted lines. Only students and mostly men were using it. They created a physical barrier, and now you see people, men and women, and people of all ages, and it's something that is really interesting. So, this is Paris. Look at these sidewalks and bikes. These are the kind of infrastructure we need. But, if the city doesn't have the funds or the political decision to do it now, okay, you can do a temporary one. The difficult decision is to say, we're going to create a bike lane. Okay, if we do a bike lane, and that's the decision, let's do an enhanced bike lane. Let's do the same bike lane, except that we're going to put some kind of physical separation where the cars will not go, because then they're going to rent the cars. You know, this is the mayor of Vancouver, Gregor Robertson. All of a sudden, some places in Vancouver, you go, you, see, you go home on Friday, and this is what the street looks like. You come back on a Monday, and it has these planters, and now you got a nice bike. And it doesn't take a, a lot of money, and here in the Bay Area, you have such a wonderful weather and no snow, then you can do things like that. So this is some of the kind of things that we can do to do enhanced bike lanes so that people will actually use it. And this has so much to do with the field department. We gotta do, think, how do we want to live? When we define our cities around cars, all we get is more cars. And then we gotta invite our friends to help us cross the street. <laughs> And this isn't far from reality. The streets are getting wider, the cars are going faster, we're living longer, you know. But by the way, you know, the, and the economy in the Bay Area is picking up and in many places, and when the economy is doing well, a lot of things improve. Public health and entertainment and education. But one thing that doesn't improve is mobility, when it is based on the private car. You know, there was LA in the 1950s, the streets were full, this is LA today, they're still full. <laughs> So, you know, is, is this what we want the Bay Area to look like? You know, this, and, you know, many cities around the world and the new developing economies are following up. Same examples. So, it, it doesn't work anywhere if we, don't, if we don't live in a different way. So, we gotta think that if we're gonna build more roads, to solve traffic congestion, that's if we were going to put out a fire using gasoline. It doesn't work. <laughs> so, but if we build cities around people, then we're going to get healthier and happier people. And we're also going to get better quality of life. And some people say, Gil, don't talk about quality of life, we're going through an economic crisis. Precisely. We live in an ever more globalized world. And in an ever more globalized world, the best people, they can live anywhere they want to. The best carpenters, the best medical doctors, the best architects, the best musicians. However you define best, community organizers, sports organizers, whatever. So we can ask, this is not an issue of quantity, but quality. I mean, the U.S. is so far in the world that if you open the doors for 24 hours, you can get another 300 million. So I'm not talking quantity, I'm talking quality. And each one of our cities, San Mateo County, Santa Clara County, has to say, every day you got to wake up thinking, how can we retain our best people? How can we attract and retain the best people? So quality of life has become the most important tool of economic competitiveness. That's why we gotta keep thinking, how are we gonna live? And there is change, change ahead. And even though there seems to be like a perfect storm, because we got traffic congestion and climate change and obesity crisis and economic crisis, and all of it seems to be overwhelming because all of it is coming at the same time. As if this was not enough, in the US we got two other elements that provide challenges and opportunities. One, we have population growth. And two, we're living longer. Look at this, just in 1960, yesterday, we had 180 million. Now we got over 300 million and we're gonna go to 438 million in 40 years. So, it's, you know, if we had a magic wand and we could redo any of our communities, half of the community, 
We, even the best habit will do it even better. Well, that's the opportunity that we have, but also the challenge. Not only do we have to improve the existing communities, but we gotta create great communities for another 100 million people in the US. And not only everybody, but for example, the over 65, today is one in 10. You know, soon it's gonna be one in five. So these are the kind of things. Think for a minute, you know, when what I'm saying we're living longer, after hundreds of thousands of years, if we had been born 200 years ago, in 1800. Our life expectancy in the U.S. was only 39 years. So many of us would have been dead by now. <laughs> you know, if we had been born 100 years ago, the life expectancy was 49, today is 79 years. So it's really incredible. And by the way, why did this happen? Mostly thanks to the engineers, because you know, the water, the, the sewage, and taking water, and to the medical, the new vaccines, and so on. But today, people are dying is of lifestyle issue related. People are dying is because of heart attacks and respiratory problems and anxiety and depression and so on. So it is very clear that we have learned how to survive. But when we see all of these issues, it's also very clear that we're going to learn how to live. So I'm going to end this part the, the, the stop, by talking a little bit about time for change. How to move from talking to doing and how to create change. And I'm going to go briefly with one example to each one of these five elements. The sense of urgency, the political will, the leadership, the doers, and the public engagement. And then we'll open it up for comments and questions. The sense of urgency, well, I mean, if this population grows, if all of these issues, climate change and obesity crisis and economy, are not enough to create a sense of urgency, but let me tell you a little bit when I was commissioner of parks and recreation in Bogota. And by the way, I'm telling you about Bogota not because I think Bogota is at the same level as San Mateo County. I wish, no, it's years behind, decades behind. Nevertheless, it was a city that was going hopeless and at least now is a little hopeful. We, when I was commissioned, we built five metropolitan parks, 50 zone parks, and over 250 neighborhood parks. This was one of them. The Pope came here, gave a mass for a million people, and the city put a wire fence around. No one could go in. There was not a path, not a garbage, and nothing. Only they planted a few trees for 27 years. And then in 36 months, we turned this into this. This is where the Pope came, and we built sidewalks and bikeways, and areas for people to go running and jogging, and lots of these gigantic playgrounds for children, and areas for events and concerts, things people could do at their own pace, at their own time, and activities. And so it's something that is quite nice, and it's a part that is very well used. But I also I love linear parts, because the linear parts connect the places of the where people live, where people work. This one is 18 miles across the city, starting one of the wealthiest part of the city, and people wanted flower shops and so on. So always separating pedestrians and cyclists and some restaurants and wayfinding maps, and then crossing across the city. And then this is where, uh, where it ends, near the Rio, on the Bogota River. And then this is what's before, and this was after, with the inner park all around, lots of little children's playgrounds. This is one of the poorest areas of the city, so we connected some of the wealthiest with some of the poorest. And we built 174 miles of protected byways in three years and went from 28,000 to 350,000 daily cyclists. And, and these are some of those bikeways are going through the middle of the buildings. Like also we passed a law that every time that they do any water drainage system, it has to have a linear park next to it. Because before it was just a dump and where people throw garbage and all kinds of things. And you know, in some of these places, and once again, the grid. It was so poor that here in San Mateo and Santa Clara, you wouldn't even dream in your worst nightmare. Because, you know, no sidewalks, no pavement. But nevertheless, let's look at the quality of the pedestrian. We've got to be consistent, especially when we're in the government. We've got to be consistent between what we think, what we say, and what we do. So if we are thinking and saying that pedestrians are first and cyclists are second, then we got to We didn't have money for all of it. So either we did walking and cycling or cars. <laughs> And we let the car, the payment for the a future administration. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is our other places, and these are other examples of different bikeways. And this is where the city is growing. Even before there was one road for the cars, then we started building this one. And it's an interesting, this is a promenade, even longer. It's about 20 miles. And again, similar situations, you know. And this has so much to do with quality of life. Because all of the sudden, for example, when you live in, in places that look like this, and you transform it into something that look like this, it really creates a change of, of lifestyle. And then, you know, like this, into this. 
You cannot really change every single house, but you really can create great parks, great schools, great bikers, great, I mean, the things that are common areas. And the Ciclovia, well, the Ciclovia is just like Sunday streets in, in, in San Francisco, which is magnificent. And any city can do it. You know, we have worked with many communities of many sizes, and it really connects. We went, you know, from eight miles to over 70 miles in just a couple of years, and we interconnected the whole city. And you know, this is something that works. I've seen it work in cities of 50,000 people, of half a million, of 20 million, and all of this. So I'm going briefly because I think the best way to enjoy a Ciclovia is to go to the Sunday streets in San Francisco. We get over a million people every Sunday of the year, 52 Sundays of the year, and one night of the year is a nighttime. And then you know, we have helped build other communities in Portland and places like Mexico. Madison, Winnipeg has a winter cyclovia, you know, in Guadalajara. Let me go fast because they're, they're already they're giving me all the green. Now it's a yellow. So, you know, the World Health Organization, they hired us to help them out and they called it, you know, a thousand cities, a thousand lives, and I said, you're crazy, a thousand? Well, we ended up doing in 2010 to celebrate the World Health Day, 1,352 cities. And your, your neighbors down south, the Ciclavia, they started last year, which is really nice, very well organized, with lots of people, and there's a lot of resources. You know, in the 40 years between 65 and 2005, only 11 programs were set up. In the last five, over 70 programs. And there's hundreds of programs that are cities that are thinking about it. And it's not only the big cities. You know, 28% of those are less than 100,000. So it's, it's small and big and all. Can you imagine Camino Real as a ciclovia? All of it? it could be magnificent. It could really be transformative in so many ways. But each city has to do its own program like San Francisco does it. You know, Paris. Paris had this thing that one month of the year, from the middle of July to the middle of August, the Parisians would go crazy. And they got the, 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 the Paris Beach, you know, and the Paris Plage. And they got all of these things. So then the mayor three years ago said, if we got this and it's so successful, why don't we do the closure of the streets? Look, this is in the middle of a highway. <laughs> and these are the kind of things we're going to bring to Palo Alto. You know, this is a community, a community table. You got five groups of people, and no one cares what the other four are doing. <laughs> so, and now the streets is every Sunday of the year, even in the middle of the winter. They got these highways that along the Seine River are open to the people and close to the cars. So it's very interesting the kind of things they're doing. Political will. We're going to have political will. As a political will, let me tell you about Seville. Seville is a city that, you know, my idea of the Se Seville politicians was that they were <laughs> doing the Spanish yoga. <laughs> but no, they're not doing that. They don't have siesta, but they got 750,000 people. This was only five years ago. No one bike. When I say no one, is not even half a percent, 0.2 percent. But they didn't have protected bikes. All of a the sudden, they build 100 miles, and from 100 miles of physically separated, they go from 0.2 to 7 percent. That's more than any city in the Americas. And, you know, when they got this in, that are not connected, nothing happens. But then you start creating the network, and things click, and people start to bike. And this is something that is really great. And the goal for 2015 is go to 15%. Then afterward, then they started with bicycle parking, and public bikes, and other things. And then people say, you know, where are they getting the space? Well, they said, you know, it's not perfect technically, but they said the most important thing is connectivity. So that was the top priority. How to have connectivity across the city. And then they created the space. You know, the cars used to go up to the trees, so they took away the parking in one of the sides, and then they created the space. They widened the sidewalk, and they created the pipeline. And these are some of the kind of things that they were doing. And this one, you know, also some of the lanes were, too, uh, were a little bit too wide, so they narrowed the lanes, and they created the space. So these are the kind of things. And now some of them are making it completely pedestrian, so, you know, so we're going to have an open mind when we think of Camino Real. This is in front of City Hall in Seville, where there used to be cars and buses, and now it's people holding hands. So it's changing. We need leadership, and by leadership, what do I mean? We think of all these world leaders, but also we got social housing. We always, I was invited to work in social housing in Mexico about four years ago, and some friends said, oh, 
are you going to work with that company, those developers? I said, don't work with them. They are like the devil. <laughs> they are horrible. What they, what they do is these houses that look like shoeboxes. And actually, when I was started thinking, I said, oh, maybe this is what social housing is in Mexico, or these are the shoeboxes. <laughs> but no, you know. So I said, you know, these guys are going to build 50,000 homes per year, whether I talk to them or not. So why not at least have a talk? So I went and talked to the board of directors and maybe they like something because then they brought me to talk to all their company. We've been doing lots of seminars and workshops and things. And a few, a few weeks ago, I was invited to speak to 1,700 mayors across Mexico. So I told them the story about this developer. And I said, but first, I want to tell you how the wealthy people in Mexico live. So I went, all of these houses are worth more than a million dollars. I went over and took some photos at 5 p.m. in the afternoon after the schools have arrived. And look at this, you know, this looks like another ghost town. I actually look like the wealthy parts of Johannesburg. It's, you know, where is a child gonna go and buy an ice cream in this place? And then on my way out of the city, I saw these buildings, horrible, where you know people living here have more in common with the birds and the planes and the people. So no wonder they need another revolution in Mexico. These houses that I'm gonna show you are worth twenty thousand dollars. $20,000, the most expensive, $45,000. And these are some of the things that now they're building, you know? Something that was very, in, look, look, this is the Mexican version. I showed you the photos of the one in Paris, and they adapted it, which is great. It's not about copy and paste, but it's how to adapt and improve. And, you know, here they have retail on the first story, and they live in the second. Every house in this neighborhood, these developments that are 50,000 houses per year, Every house has a retail within 150 yards. Every, every house has a park within 200 yards. So it's something that is really interesting. Wi-Fi. Every public space all over has free Wi-Fi. So how do you get the youth out into the parks, into the public spaces? <laughs> free Wi-Fi. And then they lower their speeds and doing this kind of things. And it's quite interesting. You know, four years ago, they had never built one inch of bike way. I'm not going to, why? Because they were only focusing on the house. So the sidewalks were horrible, the parks were horrible. And I said, look, you've got to think of the outside because these houses are only 400 square feet. And when you have a family living in 400 square feet, you don't really don't live there. You barely sleep there. So your sidewalk and your park and your byway is even more relevant. So they started paying attention. And from not having built one inch of bikeway, now they have built over 100 miles of bikeway in their developments. That's more than the three largest cities in Mexico. And two years ago, I said, why don't we give away one bike to everybody who buys a new house as a signing bonus? And the owner said, let me think about it. 20 minutes later, he said, you know, let's give it up. Now they have given away 102,000 bicycles. So, it, and it's because they want to make money. It's, so getting the private sector involved, it's very interesting some of the things that they're doing. Look, more of this, they're, they're going crazy with these chairs. <laughs> and you know, and they may follow me because they say, oh Gil, you tell us that Janet Sari came in New York, it didn't take her 30 months, it didn't take her 30 weeks, it took her 30 days to do this bike race. He said, well, to, when you told us that, it took us three days to do the first generation bikes. <laughs> and then they did the second generation, separating pedestrians and cyclists and cars. And now they're going into the third generation, which is in the middle of the buildings. You know, it's very interesting. They're creating these promenades in the middle of the buildings for pedestrians and cyclists. You know, four years ago, they did not build one single house with two stories. Everything was one story. And now half of it is three and four stories. And the nice thing is that you can have a lot of more park space because if you got higher densities and also you can have ice cream places and taco places and so on. And this is what they're doing. And this provides so much safety. Can you imagine, I was thinking, if my daughter is walking here at 10 p.m. at night and it's raining, it's totally safe because look at all the ice on the street. Remember what Jane Jacobs used to talk about, ice on the street? This is what it is. What creates safety outside is if you have a view from the inside. What creates safety inside is if you have a view from the outside. So those are the kind of things that they're doing. Look at all of these swimming pools, for example, that they have. In Toronto, these are $20,000 homes. In Toronto, the average house is $600,000. And we are closing down public pools because we don't have money to maintain. And they got all of these public pools all over the place. So it's an issue of priorities. The fourth element. 
We need tools. And in tools, I'm going to talk about New York because these two women, Janet Sadek and the Commission of Transportation, and Amanda Bird and the Commission of Planet, are transforming the city in so many ways. For example, they went to Copenhagen, they came back to New York, they see Ninth Avenue, they see cars even all over the place, it's dangerous for the cyclists. They go to the New York Times, they say, we're going to create areas for pedestrians, for cyclists, for cars. That's when I told the Mexicans that it didn't take you 30 months or 30, uh, 30 months or 30 weeks, but it was 30 days to go from this to this. And it's not about the money. By the way, why is this paint and bonnets? Because when they were going to do it, they said, Janet, you've got to do an environmental assessment. I said, oh my God. But the champions, they look for solutions to the problems, not problems to the solutions. So she said, let me take a look at the law. And she realized that if you do a pilot project, you don't have to do an environmental assessment first. <laughs> you can do it at the same time. So now she has 125 pilot projects. <laughs> but more than that, she said that pilot project is very good to work with the community because when you're going to do a bikeway, maybe some of these retail are in favor, but maybe some are not. So you can say, let's try this out for two or three years. If it works, then we do it permanent. If it doesn't work, okay, we repaint and we allow the cars. So it's a very good trade with the community. And she did it also on Broadway. Like here, who was doing, using the bike lane, the cars and the kamikazes? And, <laughs> and then she started painting, not taking away one inch from the pedestrians. Very inexpensive, only paint and bollards and chairs and umbrellas. And actually, in some of the, and here that you got such beautiful weather, you can have even better crosswalks. And what, in Times Square, that's what they didn't take one or two lanes. They took all of it. They created, it used to be an area for cars and now it's an area for people. And it's total transformation. These are the kind of things and bold initiatives that people are doing. And by the way, let me tell you an anecdote. The other day, a counselor called me from Timmins, Ontario. Have you heard of Shania Twain? That's where Shania Twain is from, Timmins, Ontario. That's almost in the North Pole, small town, 50,000 people. <laughs> and a counselor called me, a supervisor. And she said, Gil, you know, you got to come and see this park. And I said, yeah, why? She said, because remember that two years ago you told us about New York? About the pilot projects, okay, now we got a park in the middle of our town that is a pilot project. Look how interesting. This supervisor, this, this counselor, thought of an idea, a, a pilot project that they're doing in a city of 8 million people in New York, and she got the idea because she realized it's not copy-paste, but it's how to adapt and improve. And she adapted the idea of the pilot, and she did it in Timmins. So they're also doing things, you know, they're also the summer streets, such as uh, uh, streets... On the streets and, and things, so let me. That's why I said, you know, we need Amanda's and Janet's in every place. Because, you know, they really know that the citizens are paying them every other week to get things done. Not to have 20 reasons why things cannot be done. And the last one is public engagement. I don't want to go into a lot of detail because, I mean, people like the San Francisco Bicycle Foundation are magnificent, and I think that if you uh, have seen a, a lot of the work in the Bay Area, it's so. I'm going to end just by saying that there seems to be a perfect opportunity because in many ways, the stars are aligned. But we're going to think outside the box. And we got some challenges, but let's not be overwhelmed because there are also great opportunities. But it's a time to build alliances. Alliances between the private and the public and the not-for-profit and the all departments, transportation and education and public health and urban planning and everybody with everybody. And this is not a financial issue. And it's not a technical one, it's a political one. So this is why we've got to have a three-legged stool. And three-legged stool is one leg are the elected officials, at the municipal, at the state, at the national level, at the board of education. Another leg is the city staff from all departments, public health and transportation and education and finance and everything. But the other leg are the citizens, you know, foundations, NGOs, activists, business, uh, Everyone, the media is very, very important. But if the three legs are moving in, their own, in separate directions, then the stool is not going to be very effective. So how do we get it aligned? We develop a sense of urgency, such as all of the issues that we spoke about. And when you got the sense of urgency, they get all the legs aligned, and you start moving in the right direction. So you got the dogs in a row. And they are moving, but you got to be very careful, because in the past we have been working too much on doing things right. You know how to align the dog, but maybe the dogs are moving in the wrong direction. <laughs> so, in addition, such as building streets just for cars, so in addition of doing things right, now we also got to do the right things. So, in some way, I hope that tonight, to have been able to recharge your batteries, 
Tonight we've been talking about streets and parks and walking and cycling, but tomorrow we're going to walk and talk. I wish you all the best with the Camino Real and all your wonderful projects. Thank you very much. So why are you advocating multi-story buildings that make me feel closed in and separated from nature, like our beautiful hills? No, I'm not, first, I'm not advocating really tall buildings. I'm advocating lower buildings. For example, I think one of the nice things they're doing now in Melbourne, for example, they have a really nice plan for the suburbs. That the suburbs look very much like Santa Clara or San Mateo. And one of the things that they want is to densify all the transportation corridors, but densifying four, five, and six-story buildings, nothing more than four, five, and actually, they have a rule of thumb. It's, it, it cannot be taller than the width of the road. So if the road is 30 yards, it can have 30 yards. If the road is 50 yards, do. So, so that's also something that is really nice. So it's having the, builds to get, the buildings together, but no buildings, four, five, six stories. Why do we need four, five, six stories? Because that's the only way that we can actually be able to pay for transit. And that's also the only way that we're going to be able to have restaurants and coffee shops and bookstores. No one is going to open a coffee shop if it's only houses. So what they're doing is they, they, they can double, they did a wonderful study, that they can double the population from two and a half to five million by only influencing the land use of seven percent, the land use. Only the land where there's going to be transportation. In between the transportation corridors, you keep the houses, you keep the building, whatever is built there. What do we say to people who are resistant to paid parking in a downtown business district? Well, you know, I've seen many constitutions around the world. I've never seen one single constitution that says that it's a right of a citizen to have three, four, four ten places to park cars. You know, the cars are built by the private sector, are purchased by the private sector. The car parking is a, a private issue. The pe people got to pay for the parking. There is a cost in parking. So why should that cost be assumed by people that don't have cars? And you know, by the way, every time we're increasing and increasing the cars and there is not enough space. When I said that two weeks ago I was in Johannesburg, and a lot of the people, especially the wealthier, said, oh, we need more parking, we need more roads. I said, you know, this year you are, you are, get, you are going to have 200,000 new cars in Johannesburg. If you put 200,000 cars, just park, you need about 10 meters. So 10 meters of, two, of 200,000 cars is 2 million meters. That's 2,000 kilometers. That's like the distance. Said, if you build a road of one lane from Johannesburg to Cape Town and back, you use all of the resources and you're not doing anything. You're staying the same. You're not increasing. And that's only if you're going to have the cars parked, that you need 10 meters. If the cars are going to be moving, you need three times as much. So you're going to need a road that goes from Johannesburg to Cape Town and back three times. And then, so, so, so we gotta start thinking that you know it's, it, 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 there is a cost, and that cost should be paid by whoever is using. There's a lot of resistance to bus rapid transit in Mountain View and Palo Alto. How did Bogota overcome resistance to BRT? Well, there is resistance everywhere to everything. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> change is hard. Change is hard everywhere. Uh, so one of the things we got to realize in change is to start with that change is hard. Second, that it doesn't happen by consensus. Uh, and third, the citizens have to participate. I know that all of you have many things you could have done staying home, to reading a book, or going for a run, doing other things. So when you meet as community, it's because you want to create change, you, you want to see how to have a better community. So I think part of the way is, is involvement. I, I think 
part of it is either through the political will or the doers in the public sector or the citizen engagement or the sense of urgency or a combination of, of, of all of the above. But also showing people that there is no city, you know, or no community the size of the Bay Area that has all the issue of mobility through the private car exclusively. None. And thousands of communities have tried to do it in the last 40 or 50 years. You know, we've been building cities for more than 5,000 years, and it's only in the last 40 or 60 or 70 that we have been building and thinking more on the car mobility than on people happiness. So, so we, we, we're going to have to change. Have you seen examples of covered bikeways, pedestrian malls, in areas with poor weather? Any thoughts on this idea? No, I, I, I think that it's too expensive to have covered bikeways. I think it will, it's fantastic is to have covered with trees, because if you plant trees, uh, not only is great for the environment, it's great for business. Uh, you, you, you get so many benefits out of it, but, it's, but and, and also you can lower in places that it, the, the weather is very, very hot, also you can lower the temperature by 5 to 10 degrees. So, so I think that's a more natural and cost-effective idea. What is the danger to a city that insists that car access to downtown trumps all other modes of travel? Well, the cities collapse. The cities collapse. That, like those photos that we saw, are cities collapsing because there is, they just do not fit. So you build one road and it gets full. You, you put a second story, it gets full. You put a third story, it gets full. I, I mean, and that is what has happened in all of the cities. That's part of creating the sense of urgency. When Mayor Bloomberg did the plan New York 2030, one of the things that he realized is that New York was going to grow by one million people. And he said, you know, one million people is going to be great for business. We're going to have more restaurants and more shops and more good for developers and so on. But it's going to be terrible for mobility. We don't do something about it. So if the cities are not more walkable or bikeable or transit friendly, uh, they're going to collapse. And many cities are collapsing uh, for, for lack of, po of public transit. And, and, and you are getting more and more cars. And how did you navigate adding paths in middle upper class established neighborhoods? Did you add paths in those neighborhoods? Well, you know, it's a, so, something that is very interesting is that eventually they, they start using them. You know, some of these decisions have to be citywide decisions, not neighborhood decisions. The same way that some of the streets that you are have are neighborhood streets, and a lot of the, a lot of the decision has to be within the neighbors. Other streets are city are part of the citywide grid. The same thing happens with the bikeways or the paths. Some of them are local for the neighborhood, but so are the paths. So you cannot just listen to the person that lives right, right next to it, but also is listen to the extended community and how to do it. And let me tell you, last week I was in Copenhagen. The, the new thing that Copenhagen, Copenhagen already has 38 out of 100 trips on bicycle, but they want to go to 50. So one of the things, they did a big study and they said, okay, where can we increase? And they realized that of the trip that are three miles or less, they already have 65% are on bicycle. But the ones that are longer than three miles, they only have 20%. So they said, that is where we can have a huge potential. It's much easier to go from that 20 to 40% than to increase one that is almost at 70%. So they are creating the cycle highways. And it's something that they just started. They are doing 200 miles of those. And they just opened the, the first ones in the last few weeks. And actually, this week, there's going to be an article in the New York Times about it. And what are they doing? What are these highways? Are highways that come from the suburbs into the city that are where the maximum priority are the bicycles. So what do we mean by bicycle by priority? First, and, and it's, it is very applicable to the Camino Real because there are 16 different municipalities that are involved in this. So all of them are together because, you know, many times the, the limits of the municipalities are in politicians' minds, not in the citizens. Because the citizens, they live in one municipality, they work in another, their, uh, their sons have girlfriends in another, and so the limits don't, don't really apply. But they got 16 municipalities. And for example, the quality of the pavement is better, if you go at 20 kilometers, that is like 13 miles per hour, all the traffic lights are going to be green, so you will never be stopped at a traffic light. If there is snow, that is going to be plowed before any road is plowed. Uh, they also have lights. So they said, we want to make it as nice 
to, so that to seek hard and we get additional virus. And those are some of the things. And one of the things that when I said about the, the neighborhoods is that people in the neighborhood they don't want to have bigger roads because the cars pollute, because the parts make the cars make noise, because the car is also a danger to the citizens. But they are happy having paths for pedestrians and for cyclists. So somehow they are putting them through the most direct route. And usually the, one of the most direct routes is through the middle of the neighborhoods that they are doing. Thank you. How do we combat requirements for thousands of parking spaces downtown? It's impossible. There is no city in the world that has solved that, that, that issue. Even Houston. Houston has like 20 parking per household in the city. And even people are still complaining that they want more. So that, that's that's unsatisfying. Can you give specific recommendations? Maybe we can also hear some comments, some questions. <laughs> can you give specific recommendations about getting speed limits lowered on local roads, but more so on highways? Yeah, well, I think, I think we should lower the speeds everywhere in the highways and everywhere, but especially in the neighborhood. Because the issue of the 20 is very important, the 20 miles an hour. The children, when the cars are coming at 20 miles or less, they can perceive how much time there is before the car reaches the, the, where they are. When the cars are going at more, at faster than 20, they cannot estimate that. So there are so many reasons why we would have a, a, a much more humane. You know, it's, it's almost incredible to think, I, I don't know what is worse that, in the wealthiest country in the world, in the country that has been the most successful in the last hundred years. Nevertheless, we have not been able to build communities where the children can wander around safely. And I don't know if that is worse or the fact that we accept that as a reality. It's something that we, we should not accept as a reality. And, and I think that lowering the speed is something that is very, very important. Can we hear any couple of questions or comments? Directly, because maybe some people, some people don't agree with my responses. Anybody? Yes. Speak loud so that everybody can hear. I'm sorry that I'm sabotaging your cards. <laughs> they're not my cards. They're their cards. No. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that is very important. The, mo the most important issue is to make it impossible for people to go faster. So, in other words, it's not just putting up the sign, but doing the road diets, making them narrow, putting bombs, and making those. And at some point, you're going to have the fire chief coming out and saying, oh, that is, the, the, the fire trucks are, are not going to be able to get there. Uh, and then the fire chiefs usually, in a nice way, they want to do a good job, but they blackmail the city. And they say, ah, if you don't change for new trucks, then people are going to die. If you don't have the, the streets very wide, many more people are dying because those streets are very wide than if people would die if the fire truck arrives 20 seconds later. So yeah, we we got, we got to have a balance, but, but you're totally right. It's about how to do those road diets. Yes? When you're when we put a Chico Via in, in the city, does time of day matter? Does it work better on a weekend day or on a Friday night? Yes, but I think almost all the ones that I've seen that work very well are on Sundays, except New York that is on Saturdays. Why is New York on Saturdays? Because the police are too expensive on Sundays. <laughs> uh, but I don't, think Saturday, I don't recommend Saturdays because Saturdays are a very good day for the retail. And then you get into a lot of conflicts with the retail because actually the retail do, many of them do very well when there is a, a ciclovia or an open street. In San Francisco, a lot of the surveys show that the retail are doing better on the Sundays that there is ciclovia than on the Sundays that there is not. And actually many of the businesses are requesting the mayor of San Francisco to increase it to every Sunday. But nevertheless, I think it's better on, on, on usually on Sundays. So on Sundays with the data. And I think it also works much better when there is a regular. So either so that people know that it's the same route and it's and you see it's every Sunday or it's the first Sunday of every month or so on. Yes. So what what places in the Bay Area do you think are leading these kind of things? Uh, 
there are examples from around here that are uh, inspiring. Well, I, I think there are many good examples. I think, for example, for an open streets, I think Portland is fantastic. I think they, I was there yesterday in the Sunday streets here in San Francisco, uh, and it was magnificent. It was so many people. It was, it's almost like an exercise in social integration. You, if you know a little bit about bicycles, you knew that a bicycle going by was $5,000. The one next to it was $50, and both were having as much fun. <laughs> if you don't know about bicycles, but you know about clothing, you could have a spot that one had an original Nike shirt, and the other had, had a fake Nike shirt, <laughs> and both were having as much fun. So I think the one in San Francisco is, is really good. I think the one important, the one in... And I think that there is a lot of... And that is a very good question, because, you know, some, uh, sometimes the politicians are afraid of being pioneers, because the pioneers get shot in the back. <laughs> but now there are a lot of nice best cases that we can say, and it's not only about Europe. We're seeing, well, the mayor of Chicago, in his first 30 days, he did he had the first protected bikeway. And then we're seeing what they did in New, in, in, uh, in New York. And we're seeing these parklets. I saw these parklets yesterday in San Francisco. And I got, I'm, I'm off the, uh, on, on Wednesday to go to Vancouver, to the uh, Vancouver Urban Forum. And I took a lot of photos of San Francisco's parklets. I think it's a great idea. You take away two park, car parking spaces and you create a nice public space, a public park done by the private sector. Uh, so I think that if we learn from each other, I think we can move forward. One of the things is that, that we gotta learn from each other and be very generous. Sometimes the cities don't even share studies or plans with others because sometimes they got the private sector mentality that if I'm the vice president of shampoo of uh, Johnson & Johnson, in order for me to increase 1% the market share, someone else has to decrease 1% the market share. That doesn't happen in the public sector. If San Francisco has great parks and San Mateo has great parks, everybody wins. If San Mateo has great bikeways and Santa Clara has great bikeways, everybody wins. So it's, it's not really competing against each other. Actually, you're competing, but you're competing with Copenhagen and with Rio and, and with other cities around the world, other regions around the world. So I think that all of that help is, is, is a very good point. Yes? So my question is more about the architecture, and you're saying four or five stories in order for it to work commercially. Uh, one of the things I've always thought about is that architecture should be open, and even the buildings where people live above the, the stores should have light and places to go outside. Is that part of it, or is it just straight blocks of... How does the architecture look when you have to have that many people? No, I think that it's very, very important with the architecture, but I think more than anything is the streetscape at the street level. Uh, and as I was saying, human beings were pedestrians. And one of the things as pedestrians is that we only really look at the first three, three, uh, three yards, you know, or whatever, 18 feet. Uh, we, don't, we don't look any higher up, we're not looking up. So it's, it's critical, those 12 feet, the, the first story of any building, what is our relationship? And when we're walking, we don't want to walk next to those buildings that were only walls. We want to walk next to uh, coffee shops and bookstores and, and uh, shops and where there's nice windows and things like that. So all of that is critical. And also, even though I think that architecture is very, very important, also we got to remember that, for example, in the nice parks, the nicest parks are not the ones that have won the most architectural awards, but are the ones that are the, the best used. There are many parks, like some of the ones that I showed, that have won many awards, and they are empty. Others that haven't won any awards, but they are full of people. And that public space really is, is for people. So I, I do think that architecture is important, but also we got to get the architects to start thinking about people. And, 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 and that, that is a key feature. And I think that architects are some of the people that have the most sensibility to do something really nice in the cities. No, I totally agree with you. I, 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 and that's why also I was saying about the building, the four and five stories, 
because that's totally different the relationship when you are in a four story level that you open the windows and you hear what's going on in the street and you see what's going on in the streets you can just, even if your children are playing outside you can say, hey Johnny, dinner is ready than when you're in the 20th floor and you have more in common with the birds and the planes than with people so yeah, it, it's totally different and people that have, there are many stories that have been shown that even in the tall buildings the people that live in the low floors, in the first four floors go out a lot more than the people, people say, oh no, I'm going to go out, you know, it's just an elevator ride. No, but if you are not in sync, if you are not listening to what's going on in the street, if you don't have that, that, that kind of feel, it's, it, you're totally isolated. Yes? Uh, two comments and or questions. Um, one is the effect of placemaking, if you want to talk about that, you know, with TPS and how that's changing. And I think a lot of city, county, and state leaders are not comfortable with placemaking. And so how do we get city leaders to A, be more comfortable with that, and B, how do we create a groundswell that there's more than just a room full of people that believe in making livable cities? But how do we get people to really rally the political leaders? Because if political leaders are not, if they're fearful of losing their jobs because of changes to, to roads, et cetera, they're not going to want to make changes. So how do we culturally change our political leaders to take risks? Because Silicon Valley is a risk-taking place but I do not think our leaders in our city, county, and state governments are, by nature, willing to take political risks. It's very important, your question. We gotta get the politicians to take political risk. Because I think you said bold. Was when you're yeah, saying. you gotta be bold. And some are, some are not. For example, you gotta give credit to people like, uh, well, the mayor of San Francisco, when you started the Sunday streets, was, he was great. He took a lot of cuts. Why? Because he didn't have a thousand people knocking on his door to do it. So if he had not done it, there was no political cost. To have done it, it was big risk because it was very successful. And, and then everybody said, oh, congratulations. But if it had been a failure, people would have said, are you dumb? You know, where is your brain? You know, how, how could you think that you could have taken away the cars and put people and that was going to work? So sometimes you need gutsy moves. You know, when, when New York, when, when Mayor Bloomberg was evaluating whether to uh, do the, the, the Times Square, open up the Times Square, and again, that was in the year of the second re-election. And it was nine months before the re-election, he had a meeting, and I was told by people that were in the meeting where there were 12 political advisors, him and Janet Salikan. And every one of the political advisors were against doing Times Square because it was risky. And then, but he asked Janet, he said, Janet, are you ready? He said, okay, if you are ready and everything has been done, you know, I'm, I don't know if I'm gonna be reelected. So if we don't do it now, we might not be able to do it next year. Also, I cannot tell my staff not to do anything this year because we have an election. So at some point, some of these politicians uh, gotta be gutsy. I mean, the mayor of Paris, you are, you are talking about parking lot. A couple of questions on parking lots. The mayor of Paris, when they had the, the public bicycles, believe, five years ago in Paris, no one knew what a public bike was. And now there are 20,400 public bikes. There are more than 200,000 bike rides in those. And it was very risky. Just to set up those bikes, when you got 20,000 bikes, they needed 1,451 stations. To set up those stations, they eliminated 7,000 car parking. Can you imagine? That wasn't unanimous. Many people, many of the businesses, they thought, you know, if, if uh, I, I want to have my two cars here in front. Afterward, they have realized that it's better to have 40 bicycles that are changing every half an hour than to have two cars. Also, because those two cars usually were cars of their employees that they were not buying anything. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that. One more question. One more question. I think I think they turned off the. What what happened to the projector? Was it turned off? It turned out. Oh, it turned out. Okay, maybe if you can turn it on just only for thirty seconds. That I would appreciate it because I'm going to show you something very nice about density and about the plan that I said in, in Melbourne. Yes. Okay, I have to. Um, 
that's where a lot of the resistance comes. So what we really need is um, the general public to become educated on all of the issues that you are speaking about to make our job easier. Yeah, we need, I think we need a three-legged stool. Sometimes it's the elected officials, the ones that, get, that, that are timid, and they're just focusing on being re-elected. And by the way, some of the easiest way to get re-elected is just don't rock your pole, don't do anything new, just do a little bit more of the same, maybe a little bit better, but the same. Sometimes it's the city staff, and sometimes it's the community. But, so I, I think in order to be successful, Oh, it's work, perfect. We can end with that. And so I think to be successful, part of it is you you need to have the, the, the three legs. And I agree, sometimes it's the community, sometimes the nimbism, all of the sudden. But then the politicians, then when they are afraid, they say, oh, there is some concern in the community. Just because there is no consensus. No, there will never be consensus. Change doesn't happen, it's not unanimous. I want to show you a couple of photos of Melbourne. Why? Because when we talk of Camino Real, Melbourne, you know, last year it was named by the economist as the most livable city in the world. And actually now in almost all of the rankings, Melbourne shows up as one of the top five cities in the world. 20 years ago, Melbourne would not have been in the top 200 cities in the world. So cities do change. But I want to show you a few of the things that they have changed. For example, they're putting public car all over the, all over the city. And that has been part of what has been transforming the city. Something else, someone was talking about the trees a little bit earlier. Look at the transformation of the public of the trees that they are putting in the public places. This is this street in 1992 without trees. The same street, same place with trees in 2005. And it totally changes. It changes the ambience for the cyclists, for the pedestrians, for the business, for the environment, for everybody. It's so good. So these are some of the things that happen with the trees in 1992, 2005, all the ones. So these are some of the examples. These laneways, they have all these alleyways in Melbourne that, you know, they were horrible. And all that happened here, they were dark and dangerous. And actually, the only thing that really happened in these places was that people at 3 a.m., they would do things that they should have done inside the bar and not outside. <laughs> and they were transformed into some of this. And it's not one or two. It's dozens and dozens and dozens of these laneways that have been transformed some into public art. They put restaurants and some of them, are, you know, musicians and others. They put a little bit of a roof and it is and it's great flowers. But part of it is also with the intervention from the government. For example, no one wanted to set up a business here. So today, with Jim, we had a, a, a lunch with some of the foundations and some of them were talking about seed money. That's what the government was giving this business. They said, okay, if you set up a flower shop here, you know, it, it's risky because you know this laneway is not accustomed to business. So we're going to give you $50,000. So the government gave the first $50,000 so that people would set up business. This is Rob Adams who has led all of the transformation in the last 20 years. Magnificent. Going from this to this. And it's, like I said, dozens and dozens. And they're lively, uh, you know, from 8 a.m. till midnight. And it's something that is great. And how to measure effectiveness. For example, the curbside cafes where you got tables and chairs outside. In 1983, look, there were only two coffee shops with, with, with curbside, with, with tables on the, on, on the sidewalks. That's 83. This is 93. And the, today there are 617. <laughs> and the other day someone said, oh, Gil, but what happens if we don't have a coffee culture? <laughs> that person didn't get it. It's not, about the, it's not about the coffee, it could be tea, it could be water, it could be, it's about people culture. So it's something really nice. The people that were living downtown, it was, it was becoming like an empty donut. People were living outside and were just going into work and living out at night. And this was 1983. Each that is five housing, and look at this. So it's a huge transformation what is taking place. Think like this, look at this flower shop. You see this flower shop and you say, oh, you know, that's nice. No, but it's not only nice. You know, they build beautiful street furniture. And one of the things I asked Rob, hey Rob, do you make a lot of money renting this out? I said, no, we're not here. We didn't do it to make money. So what do they do? They do a very good contract with the person. Said, okay, you can rent this, but first, you gotta have all of the area clean all the time. Second, Sundays, Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesday, you gotta open at seven in the morning and close at nine at night. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, you gotta be open 24 hours. And why? Because he said, 
all of the network gonna have eyes on the street and this is gonna be safe. So this is the flower shop at noon, this is the same flower shop at 7 p.m. and this is the same flower shop at midnight. So then what happens? When you got a lot of these flower shops throughout the city at 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, they are not selling, but instead of paying whatever, $2,000 rent, they are paying only $200, but instead they are staying open. And what happens with the citizens? They feel safe because when they are walking, they know that there is someone in there with a telephone, with an alarm, and with lots of lights and flowers and things. So that, this is a lot cheaper than having more police. So those are the kind of things that they are doing. And the density that I was talking about is how to create in the corridors, in the suburbs, how to densify the corridors. So everything in the middle would stay the same. Actually, they would promote planting more trees, but along the transportation corridors with some basic guidelines. For example, what I was saying that they cannot be taller than the width of the road, and that they cannot have any parking in the front of the parking has to be on the back, and so on. But simple rules, and then showing people, because when you talk about density, people are always think of those ugly buildings in the, the were built in the 60s and 70s. So you're gonna tell people, look, this is how your street looks like today, and this is what it's gonna look like. It's not gonna kill your neighbor going from this to this. So there are many of these examples that they said, you know, if we do these higher densities, it's, it, and what, what is the benefit? That everyone in between is gonna be able to have access to coffee shops and restaurants and bookstores and so on. So that's why I say when you look at Melbourne from the air, it looks like just, just like in a city, but when you down, go down to the street level, it looks fantastic. So I want you to be more than ambitious. Only one last recommendation. There is not gonna be a Martian coming down to fix our cities. <laughs> it's up to all of us. Whatever we do or don't do. And G provided a wonderful sense of urgency. We got so many issues that if we do nothing, actually we're doing something. We're taking an action to do nothing. And it might be very, very costly. So on the other hand, we got a great opportunity not only to improve the neighborhoods that exist today, but also to do great neighborhoods as we're going to have 100 million additional people in the U.S. in the next 30 years. So I wish you all the very best and I thank you for coming tonight.